Welcome everybody. I hope you're all safe and well in these anxious times. Um, I'm Sunil Amrith, Chair of the South Asian Studies Council at Yale. Uh, for the final session of our colloquium this semester, I'm really delighted to present this conversation uh, with Arup Jyoti Saikia and Ling Zhang on new approaches to the history of Asia's rivers. Ling is Associate Professor of History at Boston College. Her brilliant 2016 book, The River, the Plain and the State, uh, won the Marsh Prize for the best book in environmental history, and it's been pivotal in the field. Um, Arup Jyoti Saikia is Professor of History at IIT Gauhati. He is author of several groundbreaking books on the history of Assam. His most recent book, which we'll be talking about this evening, is the deeply engaging and innovative The Unquiet River, a biography of the Brahmaputra. Uh, both have close connections with Yale as former fellows in the Agrarian Studies Program. I'm really glad you could all join us for this conversation and to have such a global audience is uh, one of the silver linings of, of being on Zoom all the time. Um, the three of us will talk for about 35 or 40 minutes and then I'll open it up for questions from all of you. Um, please use the Q&A box if you're on Zoom, not the chat, so the Q&A box. Um, if you're following us on Facebook Live, the questions will be transmitted to me. Uh, apologies in advance, of course, if I don't get to everyone's questions in the time available. So much of what we read about Asia's rivers is concerned with the present and indeed the future. We read of looming water conflicts, even water wars. Uh, there's been work by strategic studies commentators and lawyers on the legal and jurisdictional challenge of transboundary rivers. And of course, we are all aware of the dire effects that climate change is already having on Asia's rivers. In this light, though, what distinguishes Ling's and Arup's books, and the reason I wanted to bring them together for this conversation, is their historical depth. Both of them insist on the importance of a long durée view, if we are to understand the history of water and rivers in South and East Asia. Another distinctive feature of both books, something they have in common and something I find particularly inspiring, is their attention to local voices. Theirs are views not only from the state, but also the views of local people. And I'd like to begin by asking both of you what drew you to write histories of rivers. Uh, Ling, you trained as an economic historian. Uh, Arup, your earlier work was on region and regional politics. Um, so I'll start with you, Ling. Uh, what was your intellectual path from economic history to the environmental history of, of water and of rivers? That was a pure accident. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, works well. Um, you, you, you're right. I was a trained to be a economic historian for a middle period of China. So the driving question was, um, there was a re unprecedented, remarkable economic growth. So for that time period. So, but me, I was fascinated by North China. I began by working on Eastern part of the Mongolia steppes. I tried to understand how nomadic economy works. So I spent a lot of time looking into horse husbandry, things like that. And then accidentally, I ran into a group of sources that repeatedly point me to quote unquote natural disasters like excessive, excessive rainfall, um, remarkable snowstorm, things like that. Even nomads were um, stopped by those natural events from going out hunting. So what was, did they uh, do those sources mean something? So that was the beginning for me to dig into historical sources, try to look for more natural pattern to in order to explain economic issues. So somehow I just went deeper and deeper and then boom, here came more and more sources in relation to the flooding of Yellow River. So at that point, I think maybe about two, three years into PhD program, I realized, okay, this is the real story here. So that's how it began. It wasn't planned. That's, that's a wonderful story of, of discovery and sort of stumbling into environmental history, which was very much my own path to doing the kind of environmental history that I do. I never set out to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Arup, what brought you to the Brahmaputra? Right. You know, uh, obviously there are personnel and, and academic team both together who has jointly shaped my quest to think about the river. I live so close to the river. Maybe I can keep hearing the river's thundering sounds every morning, right? Uh, I, 
But more importantly, I think this agrarian studies program uh, and one year stand there talking, thinking, and I think uh, that brought me more deeper into the river, right? How do I think about the river? And increasingly in the last uh, few decades, the river has been condemned uh, unequivocally uh, in, in, in different ways, different that this is the source of all assumptions, uh, the regional poverty, right? Uh, it has been into the deep of the reasons, the economic crisis, the larger ecological crisis. So uh, should I not think something differently about the river, right? How the river has shaped the regional history, the river has created the source of prosperity and source of illness, right? Think all combined together. I think this personal experience and also the seeing the millions of uh, the poor people around this river, I think all brought me uh, and also a constant quest to think about the river, that how the river can be constantly changed, re-engineered uh, uh, to, to bring more prosperity of these reasons. On the one hand, this economic and social quest and also a kind of the academic engagement, my own experience of thinking agrarian, political and economic history of these reasons. Mm -hmm. I think both combined together to give me a kind of disciplinary uh, engagement with the river. Mm -hmm. I know that these are extremely uh, preliminary kind of investigations uh, and maybe uh, we keep on thinking about this river more. This can be a, a, an, an, a kind of platform to think more deeper into, into the river and it's the whole magisterial history over a long period of time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, and this is where I began by thinking about the river. Mm -hmm. I definitely owe uh, my um, debt to the great courses uh, at uh, agrarian studies at Yale, right, to think about the river in, in, in a different way, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really Can struck I? by what both of you have said. And in fact, it's, mm -hmm. it seems to me not unusual that uh, particularly for scholars of Asia, the path is often from economic history to environmental history, from agrarian history to environmental history, uh, which is in some ways quite a different trajectory to the, say, the origins of, mm -hmm. of US environmental history, where it's coming from, from perhaps quite a different starting point. Mm -hmm. and, and I've certainly uh, seen in both of your work, but also from what you've just said, that there's this really interesting path that takes you from the study of agrarian society to what we now think of as environmental history, um, illustrating in a sense that environmental approaches to the past in some ways have deep intellectual roots, I think, both in Chinese history and in, in South Asian history. Um, Ling, I'm struck um, by the subtitle of your book, and you call it a, a, a drama, an environmental drama. And I wonder who the protagonists of the drama are. Very good question. Um, I'm so glad you asked that. And I did that purposefully. Um, so um, earlier in our email exchange, you also mentioned something, for instance, of what's the argument for my book. And I think it's very, very important for me to think about how I present this book actually speaks for what I try to say for my argument. And this protagonist question precisely points to the biggest argument of the book. So the issue is when you write about drama, there are two issues to look at. One thing is you have to search for to choose your characters for the show, right? And then the second is to build up the storytelling uh, we historian would call narrative. So your question refers to the first task. What are the legitimate characters for a environmental drama in my history story? So I think throughout the 20th century, we've been looking at this intellectual trend which happened in history, dis the discipline of history, that is to broaden the range of the historical actors. We move from social elites, from kings, from knights, from men of elitist aristocratic background. Then we move kind of downward to look at the workers, to look at the beggars. And then sooner or later, we got to look at the women. And sooner or later, we're looking at a people of a different uh, ethnic, racial categories and gender categories, right? And then we reach this moment when we talked about environmental history, we start to think about non-humans. So for me, it's extremely important to use this book to advocate, advocate um, advocate the uh, theoretical point that is environmental entities, including the riv a river, 
or a water in the river or silt in the river embedded at the bottom of the river, trees, crops, soil, chemical contents in the soil, climate factors, all of these are non-human entities, right? Traditionally, they would not be considered as historical actors at all. But I want to use this book to advocate they are just legitimate historical actors, right? Equally legitimate and significant as human individuals, as human cultures and human institutions. So with this purpose, right, um, to choose these actors together with human institutions, human individuals. So I try to present a story that is bigger, broader than the range of uh, uh, characters our traditional conventional history can contain. So that's the big, you know, um, yeah, uh, the, the push for, for this book. I think the intellectual drive for this book. And, and in some ways, Arup, you chose the, the word biography. So, so for Ling's drama, yours is a biography of the Brahmaputra, which in a sense too suggests that the river itself has a life. Um, and, and I wonder why you chose that particular way of thinking about the life of the Brahmaputra. I think, you know, Sunil, uh, it comes out of my conviction, uh, both as a historian and as a practitioner to see the environment and uh, agrarian life unfolding around this river, right? The, the power of the geological events, right? The power of nature, power of the many elements that uh, Ling has just uh, highlighted, the power of sand, the water, right? The mud and all the elements that are with, with create the life around the, uh, around the river, right? I think I try to see that how these forces kept on changing the life of the river continuously, and it has also created a life with it for the river, right? The river is non-stoppable, right? It has been going on for millions of years, little transformation has been been able, the humans have not been able to do too much of dramatic transformations the way that Ling would like to describe. It is a different kind of story altogether. And I think from those perspective, and I thought that why not I can assign some essential, right? And th this is a serious a theoretical and uh, a question, also a question of historiography, right? Whether whether I am uh, legitimate enough to think about assigning life, right? But when I assign life to the river, I assign more of a biological life to the river. And how the humans and this biological life of the river, it constantly interacts and creates and continuous drama, right? With, I'm borrowing a uh, Ling's word here. Uh, and, for example, the earthquakes, right? Can the earthquakes uh, dramatically change the fate of a river, right? Can the river is 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 a prison uh, or a prisoner of uh, of many such kind of extraordinarily difficult and disturbing natural events, which are not disturbing per se, but this also creates too many uh, ups and down in the courses of the river and the surrounding life, all these things. So this is why I think this quest to think about, uh, to think about or uh, a kind of essential to the river, that brought me uh, to, to this specific point that I must use the word biography. Biography also helps a historian to, to, to think more intimately about the river, right? I can, I can think as, as, a cent, as a central force in the regional history, as a central force in the South Asian history. I think all this helped me to think uh, in, in that way. I'm struck then by, by, in a sense, the echoes across the two books, across the ways in which you're thinking about two very different rivers, but nevertheless sort of both seeking to give them a life or, or the capacity to act in a way that is sort of autonomous of human intentions. Um, another theme that strikes me in both of your books, of course, is, is inequality. And, and Ling, I wanted to talk about that question in your book. And, and the idea that Herbe is, is sort of sacrificed in this story. Um, that it's seen that, you know, that is a price worth paying 
for the state to be able to secure its aims. And I think that's something that at various moments in Arab's book too, there is this question of who wins and who loses from various schemes there are to sort of make use of the river. So, so Ling, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the question of inequality, regional inequality, spatial inequality in your story. Mm -hmm, yeah. So actually, when Arub just introduced his origin story to this project, I feel like I resonated with him a lot. My beginning, the starting point for my research was really try to see the dramatic, spectacular economic growth in middle period of China, um, try to understand it as a regional issue. So majority scholar would hold that view that was empire wide issue. But if you look at it from a political economic perspective, you realize that different parts of the China were constructed in specific ways in order to funnel opportunities for certain part of China, which happened to be my hometown area to grow. So here, when you look into environmental history by bringing environmental perspective, you realize, I start to realize how environmental actors being appropriated, being engineered, being perceived, rationalized and practiced out in such a way to serve a certain purposes. So I began my introduction at earlier to say, I noticed those are natural phenomena, but more and more over time, I realized that there was so little natural, right? We're dealing with a, a thousand years ago history for me that was already deep into human civilization. There was a, so little without being engineered, reconstructed. So, so as I dig really deep into my stories, the more I realize, the more read into it, the more I realize here. So that certain part of the China being invited, being inducted into a specific empire, such as a Northern Song China, which I wrote about, right? In order to play a specific role. And that role could be strategic, could be economic, could be military, could be political. But if we look at from the in environmental perspective, that role could be environmental and ecological. But what's the end game for that ecological environmental approach? For me, to, very, uh, to various extents, I always get back to the political end because there was a protagonist right, that was a state. In, for whoever studying Chinese history, we could not bypass the issue of the state. The centralized the government played a huge role, the, perhaps the biggest role to rewire, to replan the natural landscape of China. So, um, so I think I ended up writing this story as you properly described, a story of um, state manipulation and the reconstruction of the natural landscape for the sake of a state building. But I would like to mention here though, this is actually a very cliche story. Most early modern, modern environmental historian always ended writing about that. And then the concluding tone will be, the sentence will be uh, cultural conquer nature, right? Human, man conquer nature. Ended up, we always telling the same story. What I really did actually in my book, especially the second half, was actually to flip the story to talk about the failure of a such state political effort in terms of a conquering. So it did not succeed. That's the real story I try to tell. And that's a wonderful question and uh, that I'd also like to ask uh, Aru, because of course, you know, a lot of the work on, on rivers in British colonial India is a, is a story of conquest. It's a story of state conquest over nature. Uh, and again, I think that is somewhat more ambivalent in your story. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about that. So in, in, on the one hand, there are so many colonial schemes that you outline in your book to uh, make the Brahmaputra more profitable, more productive, more amenable to control. And yet they too, as, as Ling described, in some sense, they, they fail. Uh, if we, if we can bring a little bit of comparisons with other Indian rivers where the British colonial administrators, they were engaged with or they were quite fascinated with, uh, with the stories of the river, for example, Ganga or 
called uh, many South Indian rivers, right? They had a different story, different kind of engagement with the entire British Empire, right? And many of them, in most of the cases, they are quite successful, uh, great irrigation projects, whether it is into the Indus or it, whether it is the gate canal colonies of the Ganga, Northern India, or the cottons, the massive re-engineering of the, re the Southern India. I think compared to that, I think uh, the Brahmaputra was a peculiarly different story. It was a companion uh, rather than a, a constant struggle to tame it, re-engineer it. It is a kind of to appropriate the rivers, facilities, and passes, right? As a kind of to, to conquest the region. Uh, the, the, the river turned out to be a kind of passes. It turned out to be an, an artery for the flow of the British ideas or the imperial ideas, rather than bringing a, a forceful engineering or bureaucratic apparatus to control the river, to tame the river, or to change it fundamentally. It did not happen. For example, the, the large flows of the timbers or the, the tea boxes, right? from these reasons uh, to, the, to, to the global market. It was essentially through the river without using it, without manipulating the river to a large extent, but trying to understand the river's mechanics. For example, allowing the ships or the boats to ply at night, right? The river is so difficult, so uh, extremely turbulent at night, right? But you, you still allow the traffic to flow at night. I think that comes a uh, much more brilliantly in, in terms of its uh, using or making friendship with the river in a different way. You don't do any kind of physical transformation into the river, but you see the, you, you transform the river's usability in a such a way, right? That the, the, the British, uh, the in, imperial endeavors, they succeed, they become more, much more productive in that reasons. I think the classic examples would be the timber and, and, and the tea, right? Both flow out of the reason, uh, using the, the river's navigability in such a way. And that's why I think many kinds of mathematical modeling, right, all kind of understanding of the river's dynamics, the understanding of night, I think, you know, suddenly at nighttime, everything comes to a halt. And I think the river allowed the, the nighttime to be uh, the 24 hours, right? The way we say that 24 hours into seven, I think all these things, the, I think that, that began to happen during the, on the Brahmaputra. I think this is where I, I, I think uh, the imperial conquest of the Brahmaputra can be seen, which is obviously completely different from that of Ganga or South Indian rivers. The classic examples would be the, the Indus Valley, Indus uh, recolonization in the late 19th and the early 20th century. That is a dramatic story, but those fundamental uh, disjunctures did not happen in Brahm here in Brahmaputra. It happened in the plains, it happened in the flood plains, right? Things began to change dramatically, uh, not within the river, but outside the river. I think this, this is where I think we can pull pay more attention as a historian to think more deeper into changing the relationship between the water and the land, both in a bureaucratic way, both in a legal way, and also to see the kind of environmental uh, transformation that began to happen out of this re-transformation, re-engineering of this relationship between the land and the water that happened, uh, uh, say, around the late 19th and the early 20th century. Some of these things obviously happened in the earlier time, but I think the impact was much more leisure. I think much more uh, keen and yeah. Can I interrupt here a little? Just so there's something so interesting, Sonia. If it doesn't, you don't mind. Please yeah. do. So, um, so your question began with the idea of a conquest, right? And I think there's a, this one story Arup just mentioned: the river opened up to the night time. Actually, if we think in the other way around, that means the river's ecosystem, right, allows the total transformation of human behavior, human patterns. And now suddenly, human laborers have to go out to work at night time. So, in the sense, who conquered whom, right? In what sense being conquered. So I think just found this really, really interesting. Uh, can I come in quickly? Yeah. 
Yes, Lee, I think this, this is quite fascinating, the nighttime opening up of the rivers. Uh, the fishermen always used to depend on the nighttime, right? The fishermen normally do not go out during the daytime for catching the fish because it, they, they always consider that nighttime is much more easier. In fact, my own experience of seeing this fisherman early in the morning, they come back at night. But I think what happened during during the imperial time, I think this intensity of nighttime presence, right? Uh, earlier, it was a teen presence of humans on the river. In fact, most of the, uh, the, the uh, other kind of activities are extra legal, illegal, quote unquote, illegal activities uh, on the river, the, uh, that would happen. So wars will not happen at night, right? Negotiation will happen at night. Diplomatic, secret diplomatic negotiation will happen. But now uh, this mechanized transform, transportation system, it allowed the river to be at 24 hours uh, uh, functionality. I think that is quite interesting and that happened mm -hmm. in the late 19th and early 20th century. Mm -hmm. I think this takes us so far beyond a sort of narrowly engineering mentality of what it means to think about the relationship of you know state and society and river. I mean, this point about the night, I think, is fascinating. And it also, I think, leads me to something which I was so struck by in both of your books. And, and that is how carefully both of you managed to pay attention to local voices, often hidden or forgotten. Um, both are really sort of true feats of archival and field research. And for that reason, I think an inspiration to historians and fields far outside your own. And Ling, you write very movingly, I think, that, quote, the stories of those who lost in the game of history were the hidden companion of growth, dead bodies, hungry refugees, salinized earth, disappeared streams, and vanished trees. Where did you find the voices of those who lost the game of history? Could you tell us a little bit more about your, your remarkable archive? Thank you. I wish my archive could be more remarkable, but um, because it gave me so much pain, honestly speaking. So I always envy scholars working on early modern history and modern history. Your struggle is you have too much stuff. Right, you always have to make the decision where to stop. But for a medievalist like me, my trouble, my struggle is always try to look for more. And the problem I ran into all the time is there's just nothing there. So, um, so there are different kinds of uh, historical actors who were erased, who were forgotten in in the book that the similar kind of book we're writing. So if we are talking about local ordinary peoples, peasants, right, local citizens who live in the small towns, small market towns, um, women who ran a tea house, right, or, or baking bread. So those are voices most of the time, they just forgotten, they just nothing there. So I rely on scholarly officials, social elites, those men, most of the time men who happened to travel there and wrote a poem, right? Sometimes they didn't even write in the poem, the main body of the poem. They write in the colophon. They write in a personal note mentioning, oh, I'm about to cross this river to visit my friend, but I happened to come upon with this heavy storm. The flood came, so I couldn't travel on that schedule today. So those are tiny informations that gave me some clue of what kind of life people lived. So um, uh, I also use quite a bit of um, tomb epitaphs. So Song China was a time that literacy became uh, widely um, uh, much improved and uh, many more men and including small number of women were educated. So they do re leave behind a lot of writing and the fashion of uh, writing down the person's deeds after he or she died became uh, such a popular practice. So we have thousands and thousands of pieces of a tomb epitaphs. So I use a lot of that. And the good thing about my time period, the Song China, instead of you know sixth century seventh century before my time period that is they tend to record more deeds instead of uh, writing down those uh, flower, flowery uh, 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 praises of the deceased person 
So we do get some sense, for instance, in this decade of this old man's life, there was an earthquake, right? Or he participated in this particular flooding um, control event at a local level. He got into fight with somebody else. So we occasionally capture, you know, can, can get that kind of information. But then if you look at other historical actors, trees, the trees got forgotten, got fallen, right? And it got burned down or used for, you know, construction of a uh, embankments and being flushed away most of the time. So how to document their presence and how to, in a weird way, you know, in a kind of an anthropomorphic way, try to give voice to them. So that's truly difficult. That's why I think all of us working on environmental history, sooner or later, you need to dig into scientific records. You try to look at the tree rings, you try to look at uh, soil sentiment, sediments. And sometimes you may realize in my writing, I do rely on modern contemporary instrumental records and I try to use these modern records, try to help me at least imagine, visualize the possible situation those trees and those crops they experienced. So I wrote from time to time in this book in a hypothetical and imaginative way. So hopefully I could commute to my readers this idea that history is not about just documenting facts. It is about affect. It is about communicating and even including imagination of a possible lived experience. So that, but this is the problem that doing, you know, um, medieval history or even going back to look at ancient history. So we need to bring whatever we can use, whatever available for us to help to create a story that makes a sense. That, that leap of imagination, I think, is one of the things that's so captivating about the book. Um, Arup, in, in your case, uh, there's, there's an extensive sort of archival base to the work, uh, but it also conveys a real sense of, of lived experience from, from field work. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your experience of, of talking to fishing communities, to local people who live with the river. Yes, I think uh, I, I definitely had uh, four distinct sets of archive, right? Uh, uh, you can see from the book, right? That one is the experience, the and three others are, for example, the rich body of the scientific works, the archive of the scientists. I think this is fascinating to understand or reading about the environmental histories. For example, the works of, say, uh, geochemist or geomorphologist. Uh, I think they can really uh, help us to reading about the rivers or environmental histories in a fascinating way. Uh, maybe the paleobotanist. In fact, uh, when I met Ling, probably in 2011, she was the first to in introduce me to reach body of the paleobotanist work on uh, on the Chinese histories. I think, I think from then then onward, I think I, that is a different corpus of archive. But I think more importantly, I think it is the rich. Uh, my own rich experience of seeing these things over a long period of time. I, uh, I was born and brought up in a floodplain, right? I, I can see the people experiencing flood in a normal manner, right? It is not a flood in an extraordinary time. It is a fl when flood comes and flood detrates. And also the fishermen going out, in fact, uh, um, when I, I I was working in my new institute, I happened to be a regular visitor to collect fish early in the morning, around four o'clock, around 3.35, when the fisherman comes back. I think uh, that experience of talking to them, I can, I can distinctly remember my father going to collect fish very early morning, or in fact, going to fish, fishing uh, late at night, right? I think those experience, this, those human experience, which will be never recorded into the archive, right? That helped me to give a, a different kind of orientations to the different treatment of the subjects. This is where I think the experience of uh, seeing people cultivate experience of cultivation of rice, jute, and many other such kind of crops. There are different kinds of experience. One is experience of aesthetics, and one is a physical experience, right? Toiling in the soil, that's the tools, then also the lot of anxieties that you encounter 
flood might come, the monsoon may be bad, right? Everything can determine your, your, your journey and experience in a dramatic order. I think that experience helped me to think about my archive. The archive is obviously, you can see it, it, it has, it spans a longer period of time, the medieval literary and the religious manuscripts to the chronicles, to the archeologist uh, understanding of the reasons, paleobotanist, geomorphologist, physicist. And also I, I'm deeply indebted to, to the writings of the geologists, right? They have also contributed to our understanding of the reasons. I think this complex archive uh, has helped me to think about the materiality of the river, to think about the environmental histories, to think about the experience. I think, I think there is a constant flow of argument and interactions with these different corpus and different genres of archive. And that has helped me to think and to give a biographical treatment to the river in a meaningful way. And this, uh, this is where I can come back to your first question. All this archive, uh, which has a different kind of intellectual premise, which has a different kind of political background, and all of them help me to constantly navigate and navigate across time, across questions uh, in, in a different way. If I would not have been dependent on the rich body of the earthquake scientists understanding of the river, their understanding of the soil, as Ling has said, I would not have been able to understand the river's uh, dramatic encounter with the earthquakes, right? It is too difficult for a normal archive to, to visualize the situation. What exactly happened? How traumatic would have been the experience of uh, the earthquake, uh, uh, right? That would not be recorded in, uh, in a normal situation. I think that's, this is where I feel that we can still go back seriously into this rich body of the scientific archive, uh, archive to think about the environmental history in a much more fruitful and a meaningful manner. I think you've both given a sense of, of the deep richness of the archive you're using. Um, and, you know, I think we do have many students in the audience, um, also a sense that environmental history is, is difficult and challenging in part because it, it leads you in so many different directions and you're sort of uh, deploying everything from ethnography to sort of history of science methodologies to sort of think across these multiple bodies of work. And I think that's something you both do uh, brilliantly. I'm gonna ask one more question, but for those of you in the audience, this would be a good time to start putting your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so I will open things up after this one last question. And that is that I know both of you have been involved in recent conversations about inter-Asian perspectives on environmental history. And I wonder what you think the most important questions might be if we were to think comparatively about the history of Asian rivers. And are there ways in which you think that uh, your work could connect with or, or benefit from that kind of comparative or connected perspective on these rivers, you know, so many of which are, of course, trans-regional ones. Mm -hmm. Ling, please. Uh, okay, um, this is a huge question and it's so important. Um, let me think, there are a few things I would, like, I would like to mention. One thing is, I noticed that there's a one phenomenon when we, Asian environmental historians sit down, especially those of us who are working on river history or water related history. We tend to talk about our specific water body, right? I am a Yellow River person, you're Brahma Pucho person, and your work could cover the uh, Southeast Asian oceanic space, right? So th this actually one thing is something bothers me, I think it worries me, that is we do create these compartmentalized, segregated environmental blocks, right? And treat them as if kind of a intellectual turfs. So this is not the right way, in my opinion, to go forward with any kind of in, um, inter-Asia comparative approaches. I can think about uh, several other more productive ways to do comparison, and so we can build up a more conversation and a future collaboration. One thing is, based on the several questions you asked today, for instance, how do we conceptually rethink the ways in which we can do history 
including environmental history, including human history, including economic history, right? Starting with the conceptualization, what a world is like, what does a world consist, what are considered, can be considered be, uh, uh, as a legitimate historical actors, right? What kind of life forms or non-life forms should be included into our conversation? So this sort of a conceptual thinking uh, based on um, very serious uh, theoretical commitment, I think it needs to be done. We don't do this enough. As soon as a lot of time I notice we start, we sit down, we start to talk about, oh, what is your story, right? Everybody start to say, oh, Yellow River is like this, A, 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 A B, C, and the Brahmach Pucho all looks similar, but it goes a little bit small, slightly different. So um, I think we need to shake out from that pattern of just talk about my little turf. So the second thing is, I think, uh, behind uh, be the after this conceptual thinking, that is, uh, we need to think our methodologies. So tonight's question, I think, actually touch upon a lot of methodological issues, right? How do we approach our stories? Where do we look for sources? How do we train, for instance, each other and our students for the future? In in terms of do both humanities, hardcore humanities work, taking the traditional uh, traditional humanistic approaches, do deep, intense, close text reading. At the same time, we're not going to be afraid of hardcore scientific uh, scientific sources and the data, right? So how to train each other to methodologically become a more open-minded and more courageous. This is the one thing I think we need to do. And then the other thing is, I think it will be so interesting that it is for us to identify questions. What are the interesting research questions, intellectual impulses that we genuinely share? For instance, based on my reading of Arup's book and based on the, the, what I heard from him, I think, for instance, several things we are so in common. How do we bring in personal experience, right? That into our historical studies. There's a lot of things we can share. And the big question, my fellow environmental uh, agrarian fellow, Arup and many, all of us got into agrarian studies with this conviction to study inequality, either economic inequality or social, political, or here, ecological inequality. To some extent, we all study political ecology, right? We've all fallen that spectrum. So how do we follow this lead of our intellectual impulse and start to identify potentially comparable case studies. So I think that could be possibly a right way to go. Let's talk about our questions, right? And um, and then and 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 that will be a very good start starting point, I think. Aru, please. Yes, I think yeah, it is uh, it will be too premature to uh, give a concrete any answer. There cannot be any solid answer to your very fine and really uh, complex question. But what I think the rivers are also the best on of the the poor, right? It is the uh, it is the space for the pirates. It is the poor space for the poor, the underprivileged. All these stories. Rivers can actually help us to turn, turn around our historical gaze. We can think it differently. We can, we can break down this compartmentalization of land, of, of water, of reasons to another. For example, the Brahmaputra, right? If we really under, try to understand the history of Brahmaputra, it can actually bring a larger Transborder reasons, right? China, Tibet, and India, Bangladesh, or all these things in, in a meaningful way. The plains, the mountains, then the water, right? All come together. Probably, uh, if we start thinking about the histories of the river at the center, this will help us to understand or to think the questions of inequality, to think the questions of the underprivileged or as Ling had rightly said, the questions of the political ecology, or this, the global histories, or rather I should say a total history of a reason of a wider locality can be much more meaningful without relying on the Chinese archival sources, 
without relying on the archival sources from Bangladesh, uh, the science of Himalaya, sun science of floodplain and the mud, right? It will be too, too difficult, too immature to think about the river history. Probably a uh, river can take us all along different courses, different nations, different archives, different time. Rivers are also a uh, rich archive itself, right? Uh, if we start reading about uh, the writings of the, the, for example, the geomorphologists, they can tell us really much more complex history of, of, a, of a particular environment, particular society in a much more meaningful way. I think if we start thinking, if we start bringing the river, the ocean, sea, as your, as your kind of work, start telling, and the waters, right? This will, be, uh, this will be a much more meaningful story of land, right? As of now, our stories of land is deprived of water is deprived of its soul, right? Rivers are the soul, right? In this, this powerful, the rivers of China, right? Whether it is Yangtze, Yellow, all rivers, right? Uh, without understanding those rivers, the Chinese history is incomplete. But we cannot read these rivers histories as a singular story. It is a political history of those nations, those economies, I think, are deeply embedded with these river histories. Uh, maybe it is a time for us to come together to, to break down these boundaries as Ling has suggested to think about, right? To bring all different disciplines together, to, to think much more deeper, right? We can go more, we can dive deep into the river and see how, how the experience can be, right? Our experience, which I have de described, it is this experience of the surface, right? We have not the, uh, the experience of diving deep into the river or the ocean, your the Bay of Bengal, right? Maybe this is a possibility for us to, to bring together uh, a different kind of political histories, different kind of economic histories, of something. For example, say Brahmaputras, the, the, this region's economic history uh, will be extremely simplistic, naive, right? And, and, and inaccurate if we don't bring the histories of Bay of Bengal, histories of the Brahmaputra and Ganga together, right? I think here is a chance to improve and, and to fall back on the, this, this promising branch of environmental humanities, right? Maybe environmental humanities can, can give us that comfort, uh, comfort of to, to break down this compartmentalized uh, the boundaries of so many micro disciplines, so many micro boundary, micro departments, right? Environmental history, economic history. I think river can be an eye opener. River, water, oceans, and uh, sea all together it can be an eye-opener. That's a really inspiring call from both of you um, for greater collaboration. And I like the way you put it, Ling, sort of how can we train each other as well as, as, well as our students? Because I think that that's a, uh, a stance of openness from which I think this kind of uh, new sort of interdisciplinary collaboration can, can come. Um, we've got some, some great questions, um, which I'm going to start putting uh, to, you, to you all. Um, so the first is from Ellen Arnold. And, and um, Ellen Arnold says, I am always intrigued by the concept of river biographies. Since we traditionally structure biographies to end at death, uh, how do we avoid declensionist narratives in river stories given modern fears over river health? So you know, by writing biographies of rivers, are, are we presuming their eventual or impending death? Um, Arup, I wonder if you want to start with that. I think Alan's question is, uh, is absolutely right. I think deep in my mind, that fear is there with me. Uh, with uh, all possibilities of gigantic river engineering being proposed, uh, the big uh, political anxieties of transformation of the Himalayan rivers at the cost of two big nation states, right? Uh, I think um, there is a sense that the river might encounter certain kind of uh, dramatic transformations. We don't know, right? So this possibility also compelled me uh, to think about the word biography, right? He is absolutely right that uh, the biographies, uh, it brings you 
towards the close of something else, right? Uh, towards the close of, uh, uh, but there is a still a hope, right? Biographies can be longer. This is a volume one, volume two, volume three, right? It can go on, right? There can be always a process. Um, process. Uh, I think the river held, uh, I think this fear, right? I think, uh, the fear has compelled me uh, to think about the world constantly. Uh, I think it is an absolutely um, clear uh, and very smart way of uh, reading my mind, right? Uh, that, um, that fear, right? The fear has compelled me to use the word term in the biography, but I'm still hopeful because this geological power of the river is so overpowering, right? Overpowering, uh, and which is too difficult to describe by a, a, a historian, right? Uh, the river can only tell this story. Probably uh, that uh, possibility will keep on helping to keep on writing many, many biographies of this river in series, right? And it will be a never ending process. Can I say something Please do, then, on yes. top of that? I found, oh, first of all, I really want to shout out for Alan. Alan is an excellent medieval European environmental historian and she has a huge book, um, mm -hmm. um, Environmental, Cultural Environmental History of Europe coming up very soon from Cambridge University Press. So everybody look out. So um, I think there are two levels of the issue in Alan's question I would like to address. One issue is when we, I think for most environmental historians, we do think our research has carries a ethical dimension, and we have a um, political, you know, environmental justice issue going on in many of our research. So, in that sense, because of this ethical concern, because of this environmental, this political justice concern, so many of our, our research would address certain issues. For instance, the destruction, the devastation of the world, and in one way or another, we cannot even I feel like we cannot avoid showing some kind of a declensionist kind of a tendency. And I think I personally, I'm ambivalent about the declensionist approach or the um, tone in our writing. I think a declensionism does help to raise awareness for environmental issue, both in historical circumstances and in our contemporary ongoing struggle with global warming, climate change, and our political, you know, social inaction toward these huge planetary issues. So, so writing history, our narrative in such a way to address a crisis, address destruction, right, um, has some value. But what is the value really generated? Where do we want to guide our readers to? Pump, how to pump them into positive, meaningful actions? I think we can actually do such good work without lead our reader into pessimism and a hopelessness. So I think I, I'm think uh, the, the, you know um, at a practical level, I'm not hundred percent against. I'm not hundred percent afraid. I'm not 100% fearful of a, dec a declensionist narrative. But the other layers of the issue, I think it's a kind of a embedded in Alan's question. And then going back to my um, a desire for us to engage in environmental history in a more conceptual theoretical way, that is this question qu basically ask us, where, where do we stand? in terms of a huge history, much longer history of the universe, of the longer history of the earth, which goes beyond our very short lifetime and a very short time of a human spe as a species, right? So where do we as environmental historian position ourselves as a scholar and a writer when we confront these different temporal scales and then think about what means to be declensionist? What means to be positive and optimistic? So I think this is a very theoretical issue. We, I would like all of us in some way to engage it and to, place with, to play with the positions and perspectives um, that, that we each take when we make those writer's decisions, when we sit down to write the book, right? 
Um, the next question actually picks up just on what you've been saying, Ling, about the importance of clarity about theoretical perspectives. And the question is actually uh, what, and this is for both of you, uh, what are some of the influential books or, or articles that have motivated you to try to break out of an anthropocentric framework? You know, are there particularly inspiring things that both of you read that sort of um, oriented you in that direction or, or helped you along the way when you'd already decided that your work was taking you in that direction? That's a question. Arupa, from, from would Michael you like Hathaway. to go first? Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't think uh, that, uh, I, I have a very clear answer to that, but uh, you know, I, I definitely see that uh, my reading of uh, the history of fishes, right? Uh, the eel, the, the, the many such kind of biological elements which, which do live on the rivers who is do survive on the rivers. And there are excellent books that have been produced. Maybe I, I can definitely say one thing. Uh, Zim's uh, the terrific class on the rivers, right? Uh, as a part of Yale's courses. I think that has not many such kind of uh, uh, encounter with such kind of biological life, right? I think my, my readings of the life of the feces, there are many transitions, right? They do live on the rivers, right? And reading their, their many aspects, right, their life and times, and their travel around the ocean, around the, around the globe, right? That had helped me to think freshly about the rivers, right? For a long time, in fact, when I started thinking about the river, it was essentially a human perspective of the rivers. I started thinking that how humans tried over a long period of time to engage with the rivers, whether it is a paddy cultivation, whether it is a mustard cultivation, whether it is the many such kind of encounters. But there can be some experience of something different, right? For example, uh, my greatest fascination is always about the pirates, right? Whose mm -hmm. life, whose entire time is spent on, on the waters, right? And this is an extremely difficult time, difficult thing, difficult for me, but it is an cozy time for the pirates, right? Mm -hmm. So the pirates, the, the fishers, right? The boatmen, I think, I keep thinking about the boatmen, right? They, their entire life, their entire muscle power, right? Their entire energy, their entire skin color, everything comes out of getting exposed to the river, to the sunshine. Reading those life and times of the boatman uh, uh, on the ocean, on the sea, and uh, the, the, the biographies of the faces. Everything helped me to reading about the river history in a, in a completely different way. I don't have any uh, exact uh, the references in my mind as of now, but I think this is where I, I started thinking about the fish, thinking about the boatman, thinking about the, I always think about the boat, boatman's muscle. And this is where I keep telling my students also, right? Think about how much energy, how, how much of the muscle power that the boatman had acquired by, by playing with the river and its the dynamics, right? It is in such an extraordinary situation. The, all the energy that has been derived from the river and using your the, the muscle power. I think that helped me to think completely differently about the river in a different way. Also about the peasants, right? Most of the time, the peasants, they, they, they are dependent on the floods, right? Uh, to think about the flood in a different way, right? Flood, I was born and brought up thinking about the flood in a, in a, in a, in a hostile manner. The floods are bad, floods are extremely difficult. But when I think to a, a poor peasant, right? He is so much dependent on the flood water uh, because he is not, he or she is deprived of irrigation of irrigated waters. So I think that helped me to think differently about uh, um, uh, this kind of ways, right? There are excellent works that have been produced across Southeast Asia, South Asia on the fishes. I think fish, the paddy, the mustards, the, all these crops and the grains, right? 
the pirates, I think, uh, the the life of the pirates on the on the Darobian Sea, the I think, on the, or, or the Atlantic, I think that had also helped me to think differently about the rivers. Mm -hmm. Ling. So um, something Arup said, I think, resonated so much with me. So, um, but I'm going to use a different language to talk about perhaps the exact same issue. So for me, oh, by the way, just want to mention Michael Hathaway is a wonderful uh, anthropologist <laughs> working on matsutake mushrooms. So um, I, I really admired his work. And he has a new book about the mushrooms coming out of from Princeton University Press. So I don't know why I'm just trying to make all these like a book announcements, the books that I want to read, basically. So going back to this question, for me, I think there are many intellectual inspirations coming from all sorts of directions. Um, but two things that drive me very deep into the kind of um, non-human um, or, or anti-human centric kind of environmental history, um, there are two. The earlier one for me was my experience of reading phenomenology, um, especially Meriponti's strand. And then the idea was really, first of all, you get from the from the from the level of a reason, got into your experience, perception, right? Got into the experience, uh, into feeling, and then then you open up this ex experience of the world. There are others out there. Their bugs, their birds, their trees, the waters, you know, trickling, and uh, you have a mountain fires, right? And so Arupa mentioned many things. I resonate a lot. That is, how do they feel? How do they experience? Is there any chance that cross the divide between this individual me and them, or the divide as a 21st century person from the 10th century, 11th century dead people that I'm writing about? or the dead trees, right? The desolate sandy, sandy bars in the 11th century. How do I connect, you know, cross the boundary to connect with them, to feel? And feeling, perception, experience is a profoundly human language, right? So this is something phenomenology basically fell, sh fell short. Ultimately, how do we talk about the feeling of a sand? We can talk about the voice, of a river, and Arup mentioned life of the river, but ultimately, if there's a life, there is a voice, there has to be something drastically different from human understanding what life means, human understanding what voices means, right? So how to cross that boundary, and that pushed me to read a little bit more into um, um, uh, uh, feminist the theorists. So for instance, one in very important uh, inspiration for me is a quantum physicist and um, feminist theorist, um, Karen Barrett. And I remember Karen Barrett came to uh, Yale, gave a talk, I think, last year. And uh, um, so anyhow, so I read her work, um, the uh, so there's a one um, the ma one major book, for instance, influenced me a lot is her major book called Meet the Universe Halfway. We can never really go this deep to understand what butterflies are feeling, right? We can never really ascribe human anthropomorphic life onto sand or water. Right. And yet we are still trying both in theoretical ways and in material ways and also in ethical ways to go as near as possible. So this is very similar to what Arup talked about. Right. When you are sailing on the boat, asking yourself, how do you feel? How, you, how, how do you think of that boatman? Right. The sailor, how he uses his muscles, what he was feeling, how he acted. Can I possibly get at least 10, 15% out of that? So Karen Bar Barrett's writing um, um, use a quantum physicist, uh, physical, uh, quantum uh, physical theories, and uh, sometimes are leaping into other domains, such as a biological domain. So, so one particular article she wrote about how do we understand a starfish, right? Or like octopus. Animals don't have human brains, 
So by definition, according to Cartesian definition, they are not intelligent, right? They don't hold any reasons without brain. And yet, how do you understand such an animal? Every single body parts, every single sucker of 2,000 suckers of an octopus, each of the sucker is a functioning brain and a sensual mechanism that are way more dynamic than human beings. So if we need to write environmental histories and try to incorporate here, actually inviting, open us up in a truly demo, uh, democratic way to open up toward the non-human others, our non-human neighbors, right? So we need to get to the level to imagine both theoretically, methodologically, and even linguistically. I think this huge challenge, and Michael mentioned that, how to write that, because we're using human-dominated linguistic regime, try to capture those profoundly non-human experiences. So I think we, I would like all of us actually sit down to talk about how do we invent innovate a more egalitarian democratic language to facilitate our human historians work, try to meet other species, other being the middle way, the midway, not necessarily penetrating in the aggressive, intrusive way, or basically saying we can never understand them. So we stand here. Let's just write about human histories, right? So I hope we could talk about that, try to push as far as possible in a very friendly, openly, kind of a open-ended way. That's wonderful. We have time for one yeah. final question, which I think is a question that um, is on many people's mind. I'm going to ask it the way it's come from Peter Perdue, but others have, have asked a version of this question as well. And, and Peter says, both of you describe beautifully the long-term processes of environmental change in the past. How can environmental historians help to shape the thinking of the policymakers and general public who are mainly focused on the short term crises of the present? Uh, me or Lin? Rup, Rup, who, go ahead. Like to go first. You go <laughs> Rup, ahead. Go ahead. I, uh, Lin, uh, your previous uh, answer was fascinating. I think uh, we should really think deeply and differently about uh, the questions of the democracy and the questions of inequality and, and also the experience of the river uh, uh, and river and uh, water actually. And I think uh, uh, Peter has really a, a very important question. Uh, I think uh, the long histories that the environments are product of the long histories and policymakers, the engineers, the bureaucrats, they always try to respond to the immediate crisis. And there is, and this is their job, right? Uh, they have to respond to the public outcry. They have to respond to the questions of relief, rehabilitations, the, the disasters, right? They always see these questions from the perspective of disaster or also the economic productivity. Maybe they try to produce power. They try to the create resources out of the, these river energies. But I think as an environmental historians, which must be written in a plain and of extremely simple and uh, simple prose, because uh, so that uh, this can be percolated to a wider reading public. But I think environmental history is the wider and uh, the primary task can be to, to, to meaningfully translate the importance of long-term processes that the river, the, the climate change or the many things it does not happen over the years, right? And we have been trained to tell these stories by Brodel and many others and our historians for long, right? But I think what as an environmental historian can we do now? We can, uh, we can forcefully argue these questions of these long-term environmental processes which are always part of these disasters, these questions of quest for a quest for producing power or energy, right? For example, these Chinese and Indian, the quest to tame the rivers are essentially the product of our 21st century's economic ambitions, right? So the policymakers and and 
part of the general public are obviously they are right to see that those in that way in that fashion but as an environmental historian it is also our responsibility to unfold the crisis that kept on happening over a period of time right in a long period of time for example ling's own story that how long before this uh, uh, the drama began to unfold i think if we start writing uh, more forcefully more simple ways, more simple prose, right? And for wider public, I think uh, Sunil, your works are an example of the making it available for a wider reading public. I think that might help uh, to 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 bring a kind of dialogue between the environmental historians and the policymakers at large, I think. And probably then the globals, right? A regional histories cannot be a more effective player in, in creating a kind of dialogue. I think a dialogue will happen only if there is a larger histories. And then bring it uh, probably uh, to the questions of the economy, the questions of political, questions of the larger political ecology. We cannot also ignore the questions of fauna. We cannot also ignore the questions of flora. Flora and fauna both together, uh, combined together, environmental historians can really effectively recept the policies of the government, policies or the public opinions to, to a moderate extent. We cannot be the great player, but to some extent we can help uh, making the crisis available, what exactly happened because of our similar anxieties or our similar interventions, desired interventions at this moment, that it unfolded in a dramatically different order, in an unexpected order in the past also, that embankments kept on breaking down, right? Embankments were always a failure that we have not been able to keep the uh, rivers flowing within the confines of the two banks. That was a misnomer. The dredging was always an unsuccessful story. Maybe those stories can be more, more successfully, more meaningfully, more powerfully uh, can be told to, to a wider public. I'm sure Lin would have um, uh, more to comment on this question. I Thank agree you, with you on uh, many things. <laughs> now, um, yeah, um, there's one particular point Arub just mentioned, right? The historian's responsibility and the roles and uh, through our writing. And I totally agree with that. And I do believe that we can write in communicable and accessible way without sacrificing our intellectual rigor. So here is, I don't think there's a, such a black and white issue we need to negotiate with. So in a sense to write in the effective and accessible way does not necessarily mean to reduce the complexity to make it a simple, like a make it into a dummy book. No, we're not doing that. But um, the other thing is, I think Aruba touched upon as well, that is we need I hate this word, but we need to uh, populate. We need to reproduce. <laughs> we need more, more young scholars or students to join us. This is a, not a long work. And I want to bring back earlier an issue I mentioned. I do think for majority of the environmental historian, we do see uh, ethical and just, you know political dimension in our kind of research. So. So in a sense, uh, we are doing a collective fight. We need people to do more of that fight. So I think how to teach more environmental history, to recruit younger people, and also to invite scholars from different disciplines to participate in works that involve historical dimensions. Let's do more of that, right? So this is very important. I think Peter's question, I. Personally, I don't really think my work will directly influence the decision makers, but we can all collectively, indirectly, through our writing, um, by you know disseminating our ideas around, that will create a collective force to make a decision maker to pay attention to say, here is a issue, right? Um, one thing, I did in my book, and I think whoever read it would notice actually my biggest biggest argument is, is try to say, look, 
large scale state sponsored environmental engineering would invariably fail <laughs> and would invariably bring about catastrophic harm. But decision makers will not hear about that. Let's admit it. <laughs> So the point I really want to make in the book is actually all that will also lead to the downfall and the implosion of the political authority as well, right? By engaging in those projects, the state is bringing down itself. And I think this is a particularly important for our nowadays, we have different kinds of authorities, either state authority or international organization as authority, or, and also scientific technological in uh, communities, many of them were overzealously try to rush out some planetary pen world, the global solutions, try to bring about environmental engineering, geoengineering, atmospherical engineering, right? We can go to the Mars and we can migrate, we can colonize outer space out there who care about this earth, right? So I think those impulses actually are very, very dangerous because we've done this again, 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 as the stories we've been told. So how to continue keep writing to inform those decision makers who hold real world power to say, you actually going to do harm to yourself too. <laughs> There's some stake there for you too. So that's that's what my reaction to Peter's um, question. I would say you just have the last word. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, to respond to Peter's question, I think I would like to see it in a different way. Also, maybe uh, well-meaning environmental histories is also a process to strengthen our democratic processes. You know, uh, largely the, uh, the environmental histories are questions about rights. It is a questions of uh, the engaging with the questions of inequality. In fact, uh, the a well-meaning environmental history can also empower the people's moment in a, in a, in a very, very huge or way, right? It, is, it helps in, in bringing confidence to the people, to the people's questions of rights, questions of engagement of inequality in a different way, right? I think we can think it in different way. Maybe the policymakers, uh, the, they may not be, um, as Ling has rightly said, they may not be, uh, willing to read and think beyond these boxes, uh, uh, but this can essentially help in the democratic processes of the world, uh, the environmental histories, the way we do through the good uh, economic uh, political histories. Environmental history is possibly a best way around to think about this engagement of the people, because environmental history deeply they are deeply uh, engaged with the question of the people, right? People and their experience with the environment. Maybe uh, that is also a possibility that can that is that is also a great hope for us. And I fully engage that uh, uh, more and more younger generations they should um, engage with the question of environment and the human questions, and also these bigger political questions, democracy and inequality. And obviously we should be more, uh, we should open up, we should widen our archives in, in a very, very fruitful manner. So we've um, agreed both that we, we, we needn't be scared of, of declensionist histories, and on that I, I certainly agree with you, Ling. Um, and, and yet we conclude on, on what I think is a very hopeful note. Um, I would really like to thank you both so much. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to two of the historians I, I most admire, and I think both the sort of ethical um, and political stance that is in this work and the creativity and the historical imagination that you've both brought to your works is something that inspires uh, a great many of us. So thank you so much, Arup and Ling, and thank you all very much for joining us either late at night or early in the morning, wherever you are. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you having so us. Thank yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much.